Welcome to our long-awaited episode that will revisit some of the best questions and comment threads from the past eight episodes of Debunking Starship. We've been waiting patiently for Musk to release his 2020 update on the Starship vehicle, but that's long overdue, probably due in part to the fact that his last SN8 test firing melted the underside of that particular corn silo. Not a good time to release a new batch of fake promises when there's molten slag spewing from the bottom of the rocket that you're pretending is going to Mars in under two years, with supplies for a manned mission in 2024. In going through past comments, we are always pleasantly surprised at the overall intelligence of our audience and the degree of thought many put into their comment threads. Sure, we get the occasional muskrat fanboys show up, but they don't tend to stay very long. For this episode, they'll be happy to know it's not really about Musk at all, except when we're dealing with a crew of 100 or a colony of a million on Mars to work the numbers. The examples we use are applicable to any spacefaring proposal, whether they're floating cylinders in space or on another planet or the moon. And for the purposes of this presentation, we're even going to drop the expected transit time to Mars down to six months, even though we and NASA still find nine months to be a far more likely transit duration. Of course, Musk and his minions can claim his as yet unbuilt, untested ship can do it far quicker. So let's give them that benefit of the doubt while we still destroy their claims. Here we go with some of our favorite questions from Starship episodes one through eight, starting with several questions from episode six, which was feeding a colony. We had quite a few people ask, why did you use wheat as your example in that video? Well, as we explained in the video, wheat is a very versatile crop that is easy to grow and it self-pollinates. The uses it has are varied and the seed is easy to collect and even process by hand. The wheat grain can be stored in a cool, dry environment for months or even years without additional processing, whether using it for future food prep or for replanting the crop. Also, as we mentioned in the video, bread is one of the simplest forms of food using only a few ingredients and it's been produced commercially for over 10,000 years. Some users, such as Bjarn S, suggested using potatoes as an example instead as they used in the movie The Martian. So we went through new calculations based on requirements of a million colonists using potatoes instead of wheat. A reasonable field potato harvest on Earth comes in at about 10 tons per acre, 20,000 pounds. One million people divided by 20,000 pounds equals 50 acres, which is about 20 hectares, giving everybody one pound or half a kilo of potatoes, which is about two spuds. Assuming the colonists eat one potato per meal, as the Martian did, as a staple crop, they will require 1.095 billion potatoes per year. At 100,000 potatoes per hectare, they will require at least 11,000 hectares for a total of 110 square kilometers. And this is what that landmass looks like compared to the island of Manhattan. Comparing potatoes to wheat, potatoes grown in properly irrigated and composted soil require about the same water every week that wheat does, 35 millimeters, over their 150 day growing cycle compared to 90 to 100 days for spring wheat. Potatoes are more susceptible to crop failure than wheat due to drought conditions, and raw potatoes cannot be stored indefinitely. Also, keep in mind each harvest would have to hold back about 20% of each harvest for seed stock. In comparison with wheat, you will only need to keep 2% of the grains produced to replicate the same crop next year. One viewer called CocoFan50 suggested tomatoes as the primary crop. Right off the bat, tomatoes require pollination, and seeds are not easy to harvest or properly store, which makes them a poor candidate, but let's work the numbers anyway. Compared to grain, tomatoes have a shorter growing cycle and five times the yield, but they require double the amount of water each week. Also, fresh tomatoes have a shelf life of about five to seven days even when cooled in the fridge, so a longer storage time will require additional processing. Using the same math, we'll assume each colonist will need one tomato per meal. A medium, ripe tomato weighs about 140 grams or a third of a pound, so one pound or half a kilo per day per colonist. That's 21 million tomatoes per week weighing about 6.3 million pounds, call it 3 million kilos or 3,000 tons. A typical yield for field tomatoes, the only ones worth eating, is around 50 tons per hectare. So you'll need about 60 hectares or 150 acres producing tomatoes every week of the year. Again, with the growing season of tomatoes ranging from 60 to 80 days, multiple crops per year might be possible. But that all depends on a variety of conditions, not the least of which is the seasonal sunlight energy, 
and tomatoes are incredibly sensitive to nutrient levels, so you will have to refresh the soil. A calcium deficiency, in particular, can lose an entire crop of tomatoes to blight. Farmers prevent blight by applying calcium nitrate to the soil. And guess which element Mars is notoriously short on? Next on the list is the question, what about taking animals such as chickens to Mars? Like so many things, this sounds like a great idea, until you look into it a little. A small flock of chickens that's hatching out eggs can provide you with a steady stream of roosters to butcher and provide excess eggs for you to eat as well. Chickens eat most manner of table scraps, or insects and plant material, and they do a wonderful job of fertilizing the ground they walk on, which works really well on Earth, where we actually have table scraps, insects, plant material, and ground to walk on with the assistance of gravity. But picture this. The colonists load up a small flock of chickens, let's say two dozen including 22 hens and two roosters, one rooster is a backup. A pen is created for them in the pressurized hold with bedding, food, and water. Everyone gets settled in and then the rocket takes off. And all of a sudden, nothing's touching the floor anymore. The hens are floating in the air along with their bedding, their food pellets, their water, and their poop. In fact, it would look like this actual footage of a chicken that was taken aboard the Mir space station. Humans going to space have to learn how to eat through a straw or spoon their food out of bags. Then they relieve themselves through a tube or into a vacuum powered commode. Good luck trying either of those with a chicken. And whether you've got all the birds in one cage together or in separate cubby holes, the effect's going to be the same. Free floating fowl and fowl floating feces. Yes, you could pen the birds in place, but then you'll have the birds you're planning on eventually butchering withering away as the effects of space eat at their muscles and bone. Now, since the birds will not likely be able to hatch out their eggs in space, based on experiments on the ISS and Mir using quail eggs that had limited success, in fact, many of those failed embryos were headless, these chickens are pretty much going to be pets for the entire duration of the trip. Not only are they all going to be needed at the other end to propagate a larger flock, but good luck butchering a bird in the weightlessness of space. These birds will require water and food, and since there's not likely to be any table scraps left over from the pre-packed rations of the colonists, that means they will require additional food stores specifically for them. A flock of 24 birds can easily crush a 20 kilo bag of layer pellets in a single week, even when they're scratching for other scraps and bugs in the yard. They also require grit for digestion and oyster shell for producing eggs. To cut down on oyster shells, you can feed them back their own eggshells but colonists will also require a source of calcium, and crushed dehydrated eggshells work well for that purpose. But the hens won't likely be laying eggs while en route to their new home. Only one egg has ever been laid in space. That was a quail hen that was on its way to Mir, holding that honor, but once aboard the Russian space station, she stopped producing altogether. Adding up requirements for a six month journey, assuming fresh supplies of weight on Mars, the colonists would have to pack up around four tons of food plus grit, plus oyster shells, to keep these birds minimally fed. Then there's water, and the fact that birds don't pee per se. With humans, our bodies separate liquids from solids, even though human poop does hold a lot of water. But with birds, everything they excrete comes out the same hole, in a pasty mixture of nitrogenous waste and uric acid. It looks kind of like these dog treats. No, we didn't actually post pictures of poop. This mixture is not particularly water soluble either, so all the water going through the bird will not be able to be recaptured or recycled. How much water? Well, an adult chicken will go through around a liter of fresh water per day, 30 liters per month. So this flock of 24 birds will go through about four and a half tons of water while en route, and also require a steady flow of fresh water once they arrive at Mars. Not only is that water lost in their waste, but now the colonists will have to deal with that waste some other way. If you feed the birds four tons of food, you're going to have to expect about four tons of poop, give or take. In this environment of waste not, want not, most likely they would want to store this byproduct as possible fertilizer once they arrive on Mars. Here's the problem with that though. As their droppings dry out, they expel methane, which is the same explosive gas used to fuel the rockets, but would definitely not be refined enough or cold enough to be inserted into the cryogenic propellant tank. In landfills, the flame stack you often see burning is the dirty methane being released from buried trash. Some landfills have started recapturing this methane to insert into natural gas utilities. 
but the facilities required for that refinement are massive and energy intensive, far too large to be built into a starship. The poop also releases ammonia, which is a sharp, pungent, eye-watering stench that would also need to be recaptured and stored, since this compound contains one of the elements Mars desperately needs more of, which is nitrogen. Similar logistics would surround the transportation of pigs or cows or whichever other animal colonists intend to bring along. Animals floating around the ship that need to be fed, watered, and cleaned up after. That will likely provide you with no benefit while en route. What about using insects as a protein-rich food source? Duskona Niavarl was one of the first viewers to suggest insect farming as a source of protein. Even on Earth, there are some who think this will help solve the problems with feeding our exploding human population. The thing is, you still need to feed those bugs something to grow. On Earth, we have loads of plant material we can use to feed those insects. Even piles of produce that go to waste because they don't conform to our standards of aesthetics. In fact, in the US alone, 80 billion pounds, or around 37 billion kilos of food, go to waste because they don't look right. But on Mars, even the funny looking food grown for humans isn't going to go to waste. Let's take a look at the insects being farmed for human food on Earth presently, as found in a bag of mixed dried bugs on Amazon that sells for about $1.20 per gram. At the same price per gram, a quarter pound hamburger patty would cost you about $115. The average sedentary male on Earth requires a minimum of 56 grams of protein daily, so roughly four of these bags if the bugs are about 100% protein. The average human female only requires three such bags. Let's break down some of the basics for each of the bugs found in this bag. First up, grasshoppers. They develop from eggs into nymphs and then into adults in about nine weeks, their life expectancy approximately one year. They are pretty much omnivores requiring vegetation and other insects to feed upon. Their favorite foods are clover, cotton, wheat, and other cereal grains and grasses. Average weight of an adult grasshopper is 300 milligrams, so each male colonist would require 180 of these daily to hit their required protein intake. Call it 60 grasshoppers per meal. Next up are crickets. Very similar to grasshoppers in many ways. They also develop from an egg to a nymph to an adult, and they weigh in about 300 milligrams on average, with some females significantly heavier. However, these insects only live about 90 days, which is less than half the expected trip time, and since experiments on the ISS have demonstrated difficulties in hatching eggs in space, this creates an issue. Crickets are also omnivores with a taste for grains and grasses, as well as animal matter, and again, each colonist would need to eat about 180 of these per day to keep up their protein intake as the effects of space are withering away their muscles. Mealworms. Favorite delicacy of many captive pet lizards, mealworms are the short-lived pupil state of darkling beetles before their metamorphosis, meaning that there is a very small window where these worms are edible and they don't reproduce until they become adult beetles, but those are much less palatable. The adult beetles require fresh produce that can't be moldy and are particularly fond of fruit tree produce, such as apples, oranges, or pears. So for reasons of their diet, mealworms probably wouldn't be a candidate for space food. Also, at 130 milligrams apiece, colonists would require about 450 of these in their daily diet. Silkworms are another insect harvested in the middle of their life cycle before becoming an adult silk moth. The entire life cycle of a silk moth from egg through larvae, cocoon, and adult moth is a mere six to eight weeks. Silkworms from the Bombyx mori moth kept in captivity grow to a relatively large two grams per, but they are fed a diet that consists only of chopped mulberry leaves. Likely this restricted diet of the silkworm would also exclude it from consideration. Sago worms wrap up this list. They are the larval stage of the sago palm weevil, with a total life expectancy from egg through larvae through metamorphosis into the adult weevil between 7 and 10 weeks. Again, that's shorter than the trip to Mars will take, so proving the worm can reproduce in space would be key. Even though these tasty mouthfuls can grow to about the size of your little finger, weighing 2.5 grams, they dine exclusively on immature, living, and decomposing sago plants, so they're not a good choice either. One other insect commonly cited for this type of farming is the cockroach, but being blunt, intentionally introducing the cockroach to any environment would be an act of stupidity. None of the other insects on this list would cause much inconvenience or damage if their colony escaped. 
Cockroaches, on the other hand, could be a nightmare. Narrowing down the list for practical purposes, the sago worm, silkworm, and mealworms would be poor candidates due to their dietary restrictions and four-stage life cycles. That leaves grasshoppers and crickets, since both are eaten in their adult form and can be consumed after they've laid their eggs. Except that the life cycle of a cricket is significantly shorter than the transit time to Mars, so if these insects can't reproduce in space, they will die off in a single generation, which leaves grasshoppers as the long-lived omnivore that can eat a variety of plant and animal materials. But they're hungry little things. Grasshoppers eat 30 to 100 milligrams of plant material in dry weight per day, so the 300 milligram morsel you raise will have gone through about 21 times its body weight in other organic material by the time it is a fully grown edible adult. In the meantime, as they are digesting their green plant material, they are creating poop that leaches methane and nitrous oxide that will again have to be dealt with using extraction methods. Now for a crew of 100 on a starship, if grasshoppers were the only available source of grown protein, they would require a breeding and extraction program capable of producing 18,000 grasshoppers per day. With a required pipeline of nine weeks from egg to adult at any given time, there would need to be 1.134 million living insects, plus the egg producing breeding colony alive on the ship at various stages of development. And with their 100 milligram dietary requirement per insect daily, they would need to be provided with around 113.4 kilograms of food per day. On a six month trip, that adds up to 20 tons of grass or grain on board just to facilitate the insect breeding program until they reach Mars. That's if the insects can breed in space, which is unlikely. Also, grasshoppers cannot be eaten raw, as some of the worms can, so the ship will require a cooking facility capable of processing 18,000 bugs a day. These insects, if eaten raw, can make you very ill and infect you with parasites. And one thing is for certain, if you're planning on eating those bugs whole, you'd better make sure there's plenty of these supplies packed along for the ride. So as we've demonstrated, insect farming doesn't really seem to be the way of the future, at least anywhere other than possibly Earth, when you're hunting for food with Bear grills. Kyle Woolman asked us to look into vertical farming using hydro or aeroponics as possible options to what people are calling dirt farming. There is a third option referred to as aquaponics, which is hydroponics incorporating fish in the system, normally tilapia, and the system then disposes of the organic waste feeding the fish, and the fish turn that into fertilizer for the water in the garden beds. For obvious reasons, since they require living fish for this process, we won't expand that conversation any further. Whether you grow plants in dirt or water or using aeroponic methods, the plant still has the same requirements to grow. They need nutrients, they need water, they need light energy for photosynthesis. They also require microbiome in whatever medium you root them in to convert nutrients in the medium into something the plant can actually use. As we demonstrated in episode 6, the nutrients required even for wheat are significant. And for other crops such as tomatoes and potatoes, while they may be varied, they are still required. Remember, the nutritional content of a plant is only as good as the nutrients it contains. So if you somehow manage to grow food without a nutrient-based medium, it might look like food, but it will have almost no taste or nutritional value. Anyone familiar with the differences between a hothouse tomato and one that is field ripened knows exactly what we're talking about. Also, if you're not using the sun to provide light energy to the plant for photosynthesis, you will require a less efficient, energy-intensive alternative which requires the production of energy, distribution of energy, storage of energy, and then the conversion of that energy back into light. You will also require a closed system within which to grow these crops. And whether it's a dome or a giant building or a lava tube cave, the building, the utilities, the electric grid, and the equipment in houses all need to be considered. The largest vertical farm in the world was designed by California-based Crop One for Emirates Airlines. Construction began in 2018. Their facility, which is 130,000 square feet, or about 12,000 square meters, cost over $40 million to build, with the goal being to produce three tons of food daily for Emirate Airlines. Except, all it grows is leafy greens. Lettuce, spinach, that kind of thing. Quick growing, low profile, small root cluster type plants with a quick turnaround. So things like tomatoes, carrots, potatoes, anything that grows on a vine like squash, cucumbers, or berries, 
anything that grows on a bush, peas, beans, peppers, none of that works in this facility. And then there's the pollination aspect of these as well. Most of these plants require pollinators to convert their blossoms into edible fruits, veggies, and seeds. But let's say the population of Mars is capable of surviving on lettuce and spinach. This facility produces three tons of greens per day, so 3,000 kilos. That comes out to three grams per person every day. Astronauts on the ISS eat 2.2 kilos of food per day, so they would need to create 750 of these facilities to keep the population fed with lettuce and spinach. Whatever they grow has to be quick turnaround, and they have to remember to keep some of each crop back for seed stock. Except, there's no pollinating insects to fertilize the blooms that would become the seeds for the next crop. As we demonstrated in episode 6, the solar radiance on Earth is 1 kilowatt per square meter, and on Mars is about 595 watts per square meter, so that's a 40% drop. We've been accused of being far too conservative in our numbers when dealing with solar energy, so we're going to do a more proper walkthrough using the efficiency levels of devices in a solar generation system. Right off the bat, solar panels, when they are clean and pointed directly at the sun, manage to convert only 15 to 20 percent of the energy hitting them into DC current. That DC current needs to be inverted into AC for use by most household devices, and that DC to AC inversion will drop the power by about 20 percent. So compared to the amount of solar energy hitting equatorial Mars of 600 watts per square meter, around 76.8 watts is all that's actually making it to the end device. To work the rest of these equations, let's use the solar panel specs straight from the Tesla website, which is done in imperial measurements so we'll convert them for you. Their solar panel measures 68.5 inches or 174 centimeters by 40.6 inches or 103 centimeters. This gives this particular device a surface area of 1.78 square meters. To work some simple numbers, we are going to use the 2000 watt model grow lamp made by Vespa. To get 2000 watts at the device, we have to add back the losses at the inverter and the losses at the panel to figure out how much coverage we need. As it turns out, that's 16,600 watts worth of real estate. And at 600 watts per square meter radiance, that works out to 27 square meters or 16 of Tesla's 1.78 square meter solar panels to power this single grow lamp. That takes care of the daytime operation, but these lights need to stay on 24-7. So while the sun is out, we need to create additional power to store, and that power has to be inverted, stored in a battery, and inverted again to be converted back into light. You'll lose 20% at the inverter going into the battery, lose 10% in the battery itself, and another 20% injecting it back into the system. If it takes 16 panels to power it during a 12-hour day, it will take an additional 28 panels to store the energy it will need at night for a total array of 44 panels to power this single light. In regions away from the equator where water ice has actually been identified, even more panels will be required to account for the shallower angle of incidence on the panels, as well as seasonal variations in the amount of daily sunlight. Also, this equation does not take into account any other energy requirements such as heaters, pumps, fans, filtration systems, life support, computer controls, or anything else. Now if we use the Dubai Crop 1 facility to wrap up the conversation regarding total energy cost of the facility, their estimated energy requirements for growing lettuce is 3500 kilowatt hours annually per square meter compared to 250 kilowatt hours for the same footprint in a traditional greenhouse facility. So this one facility would require 3,500 times 12,000 square meters equals 42 gigawatt hours of energy annually to grow their crops. That compares to a 12 megawatt hour consumption annually by an average 200 square meter home, which is one reason why even on Earth, the sustainability of vertical farming is still questionable. The other lesser concern they have is the manpower required to maintain the crops and the facilities, all of which drive up the price. What about using algae for food? This question from several viewers sent us looking for information we had not previously considered, to be honest, mainly because algae grows in water and water is in very short supply on Mars. Unfortunately for the viewers asking, it was a very short search since we discovered straight away that uses for commercially grown algae include food coloring, fertilizer, bioplastics, chemical feed, medicines, 
pollution control, and fuel. You'll notice what's not on that list is food for human consumption. Now, while it is true that scientists and entrepreneurs have been trying for years to make a case for algae as a cure to world hunger, there seems to be little appetite for growing green slime for humans to eat. Ingested algae seems to be limited at present to being an ingredient in overpriced green smoothies. Further, the algae farms growing for the other purposes are mostly powered by the sun, not enclosed indoors with artificial lighting. In fact, in enclosed hydroponic systems, algae is generally considered a scourge to be eradicated because it clogs up pumps and filters. The last segment of this episode has nothing to do with Starship. It does, however, have everything to do with Elon Musk. We're going to wrap up this segment by demonstrating conclusively that muskrat fanboys will buy anything Musk puts out, regardless of price, regardless of quality. And to do that, we need look no further than two weeks ago when Musk released Tesla Tequila. On November 5th, 2020, Musk created a sensation in the muskrat community when he released his Tesla Tequila, complete with a fancy bottle and an even fancier price tag of $250 per 750 mils. The entire overpriced batch was sold out almost immediately. Here's the problem. Tesla doesn't operate a tequila distillery. So where did the booze come from? As it turns out, the distiller they partnered with is called Nosotros. They are a three-year-old craft producer who had never previously produced an Aneo tequila like the one they bottled from Musk. And honestly, good for these two brothers to be able to attract such a high-profile client. The question is, are their tequilas any good? Let's put it this way, they offer two standard products, a tequila blanco that sells for $40 and a tequila reposado that sells for $45, both of them in 750 ml bottles. Comparing them to the 1800 branded tequila, their online pricing for their reposado is $34 and their anejo is $43. This places Nosotros standard fare in the same region as 1800's entry level offerings or Patron Silver by price comparison. In other words, the cheapest bottles the other two distillers sell. And while the case could be made that the Anejo is a different product, it is also something that this particular distillery had never attempted before. So basically, the people buying up these bottles pay $250 for bottom of the barrel booze, just because the fancy bottle has Tesla's logo on it. As with all things Musk, what people are buying is the novelty, the hype. Not an original idea, not even a high quality product. And for reasons unknown, there seems to be no end to the number of people stupid enough to keep handing this guy their hard-earned money. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic, which was supposed to be the top 10 questions asked by our viewers, but we're running kind of long. So we're going to keep going on the countdown in our next episode. Feel free to add your unanswered questions about Starship or Mars colonization in the comments below so we can consider including them in upcoming episodes. Visit our discussion panels on Instagram, Reddit, and Facebook, as well as our YouTube community page. Give the video a thumbs up, share the video, and hit subscribe, so you'll be the first to know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.